We are talking to Rita Houskin, who is a 52-year-old coach, speaker, entrepreneur, investor, and advisor who is now 99 days alcohol-free as we are recording this. And Rita is based uh, in a place called Stavanger on the west coast of Norway. Uh, and Rita helps women in male-dominated industries to create more influence, and she is very proudly, uh, and I'm very proud of her, I should say, uh, 99 days alcohol-free today. Rita, so great to have you here. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Rita, just uh, share a little bit about you and what you do, if you if you will, and maybe... Um, you know, a little bit about life in, in Norway, just to give context. And then I'd love to, to get in and, and share a little bit about your, your journey from societally acceptable drinker that was holding you back to how you feel now on 99 Days Alcohol Free. So just share a little bit about yourself, if you will. Yeah, no, definitely. So like you said, I'm 52 years and then I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. And um, my background is I was a director for an international press for about 20 years. So a lot of traveling, a lot of, you know, up in the air, a lot of um, glasses <laughs> on my journey. Um, my, my life here in journey is, is filled with adversity as I have a son with a very rare disorder uh, who is... Um, he is now 25, but he was expected to die when he was seven. So I've had a lot of, you know, um, challenges uh, in my life, which also made me think about life as important to live every single day because you actually don't know how long you are going to live and you don't know how long your closest one is going to live. So it's been important to me to fully embrace life. Um, which is also why I became an entrepreneur. I wanted to be able to step in fully to help other women to bring their creativity to the table and understand that the creative ideas that they have isn't lesser because maybe a CEO says, mm, I don't think that idea is great. I always say that that means that your idea is needed elsewhere, but you need to continue on your dreams and following this idea. So that's why I work um, with women in male-dominated industries to, to get their voice heard and their ideas on the table and taking action on, um, because that's what happened with myself through the journey with my son. I learned that creativity, speak up about your ideas is super important. So, I mean, obviously what has happened as of late is, um, you know, with the COVID kicking in, it's been... Um, changing life quite dramatically also here in Norway even though it's been maybe easier than many other countries but it has had, has its effect on myself um and a woman who loves creativity I think I felt that alcohol was uh, my own trigger how do I keep my creativity going and I thought ah, alcohol alcohol always helped me um and that was something that, like, I, when I were in contact with you first time was basically in 2017. I, I went through the same thing that I was, I really want more creativity. And I realized that I used alcohol to trigger that. And uh, then to realize that it doesn't, it's not sustainable to do that. So, um, yeah, so that's where I'm at on the moment. When you were um, drinking, Mm. At what point did you realize that maybe it was no longer serving you? Like when was when did you realize that there was a shift between oh I'm drinking to create creativity mm. and then you realize oh I'm drinking and now this is actually sapping my creativity. Yeah. I think I had uh two incidents uh on that specifically one was actually back in 2019 when I was again working on a big project and I realized that you know constantly turning to to um a glass of wine and and whatnot um suddenly made me spend less of the day in creativity 
and more and relaxing than creativity. And, and I realized it was sabotaging me, sabotaging my creativity. I think on the outside, everyone would say, oh my, she is so successful. She knows, she's got it. But deep down, I felt that this, there was this kind of, I don't know, dark side of it all. And I just didn't like myself. I didn't like myself. Um, I could wake up in the morning and feeling like uh, a feeling of guilt, not because I actually had had been drinking, but because I hadn't produced what I wanted to produce. So then um, then this year, uh, when COVID hit, I used alcohol also because I felt... I was kind of numbing something. I, I couldn't travel anymore. I was used to traveling the world and I missed my glass of champagne when I was going into the lounge or something like that. So I don't know, something just happened there. And uh, at the same time, I had decided that 2020 was going to be an exponential year. That was the word I gave the year in January 2020. And that was nagging me. Where is the exponential here? And I said, I had it. I'm not going to have this anymore. And then I reached out uh, to you knowing that this is, I've, I've read so many other comments about this 90 day program. I thought there are two reasons why I have to do this. I have to do it because I want to ensure that my creativity is top. My health is good. Also, I have so many clients that was going through the same thing. And I said, I cannot take a client deeper than I've been myself. That means that if I were to experience a program that could be a help, I wanted to test that out. So these two reasons made me contact you. And then I embarked on this, uh, this journey, um, which I... It's mind blowing. I, I don't know what else I can say. Um, I think even <laughs> after like five days, my the boost was so powerful. The energy that came back, and I think it was a mix of both having made my decision. We all know that if you're fumbling around, have made that your decision is like. Ugh then nothing happens. But the minute I made my decision, I made my commitment, I was embarking on this journey. It was twofold. I wanted to experience it on behalf of my clients. How can I support my clients? Because I was going through it myself and with other people and the community. Um, and as a result, very, very fast, I think the the biggest shift, and this is interesting because this is what I'm working with my clients on, is how do you gain confidence? I mean, true, deep confidence. And I realized something that I didn't know before, that when you're consuming alcohol over a longer period of consecutive time, anxiety starts showing up. And anxiety is a deal breaker. I mean, you're killing your creativity. You're really holding back on things. I was holding back on launching some programs because I wasn't sure if that was the right thing. And just removing this anxiety was literally only triggered by that poison. I could go out and launch things that I had been holding back on for a long time. And I felt that boost of confidence, again, that this is what I'm working with, with women on. I'm working with how do you confidently communicate your ideas around the leadership table, regardless how crazy these ideas might be. And then I have, I've had these ideas myself and I realized that I was holding them back, but I couldn't understand why until I skipped. The, the kind of daily consumptions of creativity alcohol, but I called it, and then I could step fully into it. And now I just actually launched my second company. And um, Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so that's where I'm at. What's really interesting is that um, you actually first entertained the idea of joining us in our 90-day 
quit drinking program back in 2019, in July of 2019. Um, But it took until June 2020 for you to actually enroll and take that step. Yeah. Um, And with your permission, I'd love to just, I've actually pulled up your your application for the 90 day program from July of 2019. And with your permission, I'd just love to read a couple of the sentences that you wrote down there and then just see how that resonates with you now with the benefit of hindsight. So this is 15 months later, you know, tell me, tell me what your thoughts are based on this. So I'm reading from readers um, application for our 90 day program. It's uh, dated July 15th, 2019. And one of the questions was, um, why do you wish to overcome this struggle with alcohol? And what you wrote was, it's holding me back from showing up fully energized and creative and preventing me from growing my business. I asked um, in the application, how long do you feel you've had this problem? And you answered five years. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then I asked, why do you feel... Um, coaching and accountability will help you. And you said, to have deep and meaningful conversations is important to me. And to have a coach who understands the specific challenge to become alcohol-free and can give insights on how to get there easier than being alone in this. It will help me. Being accountable to myself by being held accountable through a coach is key to my success. Um, Later on, I asked you um, in the application, I said, why is, is... having this call a must for you right now like why is taking action a must for you right now and bear in mind this is back in july of 2019 um which is uh almost 12 months before you actually did take action and and enroll this is this is not designed to to be critical it's just more of an observation of human nature um but when i asked you that question why is it a must now you answered i want to take on the four fully energized and creative Channeling all of me into that is key in order to kick off a new decade, 2020, uh, on top of and growing my game. I have been and still am this week, and I realized how much alcohol has consumed my energy the past six months. The past five years, I've too easily had a glass of wine several times a week. I didn't consider it a problem. The past six months, it has escalated because I turned to it feeling it made me more creative. And now I've had enough of this. It's time to change. So uh, there are a few things in there, but I'm just curious, you know, what are your thoughts on that, hearing that now some 15 months later? <laughs> uh, I think I was spot on. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and also what I wanted to say, the reason why I didn't enroll was that my son turned really sick. Mm. Um, and again, I was just all in on, on focusing on, on my son at the moment. Um, it was the same thing that then, so what happened after was that I did actually go, I did it myself. I went in, I did my three months and, uh, felt great about it. Uh, the only thing is I didn't have it anchored in anything. I just did it. You know, when you often talk about white knuckling something, I did that because I was, if, okay, I can do this on my own. But it's more fun to do it with other people. I think that is what my big experience was. Uh, what I can say is that all that was delivered. I think that is a fascinating thing. It's like when I'm reading it, I can feel it. It was exactly the same thing when I felt it in March, April, when it, when it came back, the excuse with the wine, COVID, can't do anything, can't go out, lockdown, blah, blah. And I was like, this is again another moment to escalate and grow my business. I've always been virtual. You know, this is my time. I was helping people every single day, every morning from 8 till 8.30 from all over the world. I was helping people to go through COVID, like my volunteer project. And I started to realize that, wow, I need my own energy to pick me up. I can't have wine picking me up. I mean, this is this is horrible. So what I, what I wrote then is exactly what came back to me basically in 2020. And this time, even though that something was preventing me from doing this three times, I was trying to have the conversation with the coach. 
two times it was something happened and whatever, he didn't show up. And then on the third time, what I was about to say, hmm, maybe I'm supposed to go on this journey on my own. I was like, no, it's a reason why I'm going to do this. I am just tested slightly right now. And I went there and I had this conversation. And then, of course, the day after I was talking to Kevin and, <clears throat> and that creativity that I was kind of seeking, the true creativity has absolutely come true. It's been fulfilled. And not only that, but I think I have learned so much more about myself. Like I remember in the beginning, you know, when these kind of cravings came up, like, oh, well, now it would be nice to have a glass of wine. I, I was simply leaning into it. Like, what is it? my body is trying to tell me right now because what is it that I truly need? I don't need alcohol. I knew that. Uh, And I realized that what my body constantly was asking me for was actually more sleep. It didn't need more creativity because I'm a super creative person. I am full of being and energy. It needed the opposite. It needed to slow down, which is one of the five pillars in my own program. And I needed to step into slowing down. And that's where my creativity on a much, much deeper level showed up for me. So it's a delivered 10x, I would say, uh, compared to what I was hoping for. And, and, And the funny thing is this. I kind of thought that I'm sure that, you know, after 90 days, I would like, okay, well, it's okay. Now I can go back and have a glass of wine. I don't even keep count. That is like, you ask me how many days. I was like, I don't know. I don't receive mm-hmm. your videos anymore. So I, I don't know. So 90 something. <laughs> and that's mm-hmm. quite a li- like uh, relieving, like it's freedom. And, and also what I want to say, one of my core values, my main core value that drives everything that I do in my life is freedom of expression. Mm. That was a big part of my decision as well, because what I came to realize was that when you're consuming alcohol to be creative, it's actually preventing you from your full freedom of expression. Mm. Something is holding you back or you maybe express something that you, mm, that was not exactly what I wanted. And you think the day after, what on the planet did I, what was that? So in order to, now when I'm kind of going in and, and, and gauging myself and say, okay, freedom of expression, Rita, how am I expressing myself fully in this moment? And I've come to realize that when I'm showing up with my glass of tonic, I am actually expressing myself more than when I'm ex- showing up with a glass of wine. So that is where I turn into now. Does it serve my core value of freedom of expression? So far, it hasn't. So that's where I'm at now. Mm. Beautiful. That's so lovely to hear that uh, the freedom of expression is unleashed when you're <laughs> alcohol free as opposed to suppressed by the sounds of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's quite remarkable to, and I've, I'm journaling every day. I've done that for many, many years, and, and I'm kind of just going back and looking and how I was feeling. And, and that freedom of expression aspect is very, very important. It shows up in t- every text I'm writing as well, that I'm just actually more creative in my expression as well. Mm. Um, thank you for telling us a little bit about um, your son. Um, yeah. I would love to know just a little bit more, if you're willing to share with me and, and uh, my audience, just a little bit about, um, you know, how your, your son and his condition has influenced and shaped the, the woman who you are today um, mm-hmm. and particularly if your relationship with him has shifted or changed any mm-hmm. since you've been alcohol-free, is there a noticeable difference between when you were drinking mm-hmm. um, and now not drinking? 
Has that stayed the same? Have you noticed any any shift there? But if you would, just give us a little bit of a context uh, around you and, and, and your son. Yeah, so um, to, to answer the question about has he shaped my life, he has definitely cha- uh, shaped my life. And I am a woman that can truly say that I believe that when we say the word impossible, that means I'm possible. Um, when Benjamin was two years old, he received this diagnosis, Hurlis syndrome. I was told, or we were told, that he would most likely die between seven and 12. We would be very lucky if he would live until he was 12 years old. I was, uh, by all experts, given the same advice, which came from a loving heart, and that was to quit your job, stay at home, make sure that you feel that you have spent all the quality time with him and pick up your life when he's dead. And I remember for a period of time that I was stepping into that. I was living, I was living that life to such a degree that I didn't even see him in front of me anymore. Like he was already gone. I was only only preparing his funeral, my speech, the music and everything. I wasn't present. And then one morning it came to me that I have a very strong saying in my family, and that is as long as there's life, there is hope. And I realized that, well, I cannot change his diagnosis. So I can choose either to be a victim of the circumstances or I can ask myself, okay, now how is this happening for me without knowing that I can't change his diagnosis? So I realized that I had an opportunity to go out in the world and help other families in similar situations and help doctors to understand that First of all, each child, each child will, will go through their illness very uniquely, differently. You cannot just say this is how it is. And I said that, isn't this an invitation to embrace life instead of embrace death? Isn't this the time to say, okay, what can we do now every single day to, to feel the energy of life? So I started to do that. So my vision was super clear that I'm going to seek out other families around the world. And this, remember, this is almost not before internet time, but this is in 1994, uh, things were different. But I started and I seek out other families and I even decided not to work with families in Norway, I decided to work with families in countries that are more forward lean in their thinking, not relying too much on the government and support, like the US, Australia, England, I, you know, contacted. And now through that work, I, st- and I, through the work, I also decided I need to take on an equally heavy career as I have a private life. I needed to balance out my challenges with my son with a challenging career with one mission, to be so confident in myself that I could reach out to any person, high or low, to help me with my son, which resulted in talking to any experts in the entire world, getting in contact with a professor in the US, working on a drug, helping you know, with the process, and being part of releasing a, a drug and some therapy. So... What I realize is when somebody comes to me and say, that's impossible, 99% of the world says, in all due good heart, don't waste your time on this, it's impossible. I can raise my hand and say, there are no such thing. I believe in it. I am possible. And today he's the oldest living in the world. He's 25 years old. So when it comes to your question about alcohol. I would say that alcohol has actually never really been in the way for my relationship with my son. Absolutely. And and the reason I'm saying that is that I've, I have never been a high consumer of alcohol. I mean, it's never, never really like that. But what I realized was that I use alcohol when I should use something else. And, and for me, that it didn't matter how much it was. It was, it was a, for me, the wrong thing I went to. It could be anything else. It could have been food, overeating of food. Now it was the one. So no, it didn't affect me in that respect. However, what I do notice is that because I'm so self-aware and I believe 
in the presence of moment. What I do, and I've done that a long period of time, is that I dedicate specific time where I'm simply sitting with my son and looking at him, feeling him, because he doesn't have any language. We can't communicate normally. So when I'm saying, like, okay, well, how do we really connect on a deeper level? I do that through dedicated time of simply being with him to understand his needs. So maybe that is just even more clear to me now. And it's always been there. Always yeah. been there. Mm. I'm, I'm hearing presence. Yeah. I'm hearing what you're saying is, is that you have incredible presence with your son. Yeah. And maybe you're noticing you have more presence with, with him now than you did previously. Yeah. Uh, that is a common theme, certainly amongst people. Um, who go alcohol free for at least 90 days as they do in in project 90 our quit drinking program um there's a there's another member who who i think you may have gone through with at least for some of the time um who wouldn't mind me sharing his name now because um i've interviewed him and um he's made himself available for the for the show um russell belcher and russell mm-hmm. is a um uh 44 year old um father of of two in uh, New South Wales in Australia. And uh, Russell shared that when he was drinking, and again, he wasn't, you know, what society would call an alcoholic. He was just a societally acceptable drinker and that he was drinking a couple of glasses of wine a night, some beers, some, some, some cans of bourbon and Coke. Wasn't really getting drunk, but he was, you know, spending time drinking. And what he came to realise is that he wasn't being present with his two kids and both of his kids are under the um, age of five, five or six, actually. I think it might be five-year-old and a three-year-old. And he wasn't, he was, he he was in the same room as them, but he wasn't present with them. He was in the same logistical space, but he wasn't attentive. He wasn't really there. He was there in body, but he wasn't there in attentiveness. So when you were sharing what you were sharing, it doesn't sound like you, it, it certainly sounds like you've, you've always had a beautiful relationship with, with your son, but it seems like maybe you're noticing just how present you are and maybe even slightly more presence than before. Is, is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, absolutely. I think, I think the presence is probably the most important value of being alcohol-free. Like being being present, not being so agitated. So so maybe more so with maybe others is that I'm noticing just that I'm generally calmer. I'm just generally allowing them to speak up and speak out and like, I'm just listening and, you know, doing what I'm really doing in my practice. I'm just doing that, doing that as a general rule. And I think that creates peaceful uh, experiences in, around. And, and, and of course it's, it's a challenge to live in a household Uh, with a uh, very sick son so you need to ensure and 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 this family is a household of six people because benjamin's nurse is living in the house with her husband and child and so there is a lot of balancing going on here and the entire house is now designed for my son and i'm just kind of I don't know, renting a room in my own house kind of thing. So, so to, to always show up in harmony makes it easier, makes it easier. And I think that, so that is something I've always done, but I've realized that when I would then, let's say, travel or something like that, then I would let go. And again, using alcohol as they booster for creativity because traveling was very often when I got out of the house, kind of my free time from Benjamin, this is when I would like, now I'm going to go all in on my creativity. Okay. Well, I know exactly the regime, a bottle of Chablis, everything's set. Oops. I'm going to be super creative. 
And I did. And I showed that creative. And then, but the only thing is I wasn't creative long enough. And I think I didn't get deep enough in my creativity. And I think that is a fascinating thing because I think a lot of us think that a glass of wine just boosts your creativity. No, it it boosts maybe a good feeling, whatever. But the actual creativity, at least in my experience, is on such a deeper level. And alcohol doesn't allow you to go down on that level. But creativity is a lot of emotions. Maybe emotions you don't really like. But not exactly in that feeling or not feeling well. Well, hang on, that's exactly creativity. I really need it right now to write that specific word to appeal to other people. That is what I see. That's why I would never, I can, one thing I can guarantee, I will never ever in my life use anything like alcohol as a creative boost in my life. It doesn't work. It actually do the opposite. So, so that's, yeah, so the awareness, the present, I think in, in, in the creativity sphere, you are super present. That's why it's so important for me. Um, yeah. Rita, when you were inside of our um, program, of course, you like I just said, you're based in um, Stavanger on the west coast yeah. of Norway. So the time difference to a lot of our um, coaching calls, um, you know, most of our, our members are in based in the United States. We have people in Australia. We've had people in New Zealand. We've, we've had folks from Canada. We've had folks from the UK um, and, couple, uh, and some other places in Europe, of course. Yeah. Um, I think you're the first uh, person from Norway to, to be, in a, be in our group. But there is a, a challenging, at times challenging, time zone issue there, isn't there? Um, <laughs> um, how did you make that? Um, how did you make that work? Because you're you're someone based in in Norway, participating in a group of people who are mostly in the United States. Even though we have people in Australia, look, look, as as the producer and creator of this program, we make all time zones work. But having said that, for some time, sometimes people have got to get up in the you know late at night. Other people have got to get up early in the morning. So. How did you make it work for you so you could be engaged and participate and connect with other members? Yeah, yeah. Oh, good question. I love it. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> first of all, I mean, getting it on the calendar. <laughs> that was super important. And so for me, it would be 9 p.m. Um, that the, the uh, groups were starting. So I would participate Mondays and Fridays. I love, oh, Goodness, I loved it. It's such a community. So, of course, I mean, I'm an early riser. I mean, I usually get up at five in the morning to do my morning routines. So that means that usually I'm asleep by 10. Uh, so, but I, I committed to this and I also allowed uh, the changes in, in my sleep pattern to show up. Like I shared before, I realized that I needed more sleep more than anything. So what I did was to put it on the calendar, <clears throat> Mondays at nine, Fridays at nine. And even though there were things happening on the Friday, I said, no, this is what I want. This serves me the most. And I would r- ask other people, could they change their schedule for a, a party or something to the Saturday instead? So I committed. Um, the other thing that I have to say, which has been such an aha moment for me, is the use of Marco Polo. I mean, really, I'm using this with my clients as well now. I mean, so just for uh, context, maybe you could maybe you could just explain to the, who's list, to the listener what Marco Polo is. And of course, I know because I I introduced this um, you know software, I guess, to our community. But it might be better for you to explain what it is rather than me. I will definitely. So uh, when I'm explaining it to my clients, I always say it's the same as if you think that on Messenger you're using a voice memo or WhatsApp you're using a voice memo, you're doing exactly the same, but now you're recording a video. And that video uh, is real time, but it shows up just like somebody will kick off and see a uh, uh, listen to a voice memo. They will now 
watch a video of Nemo instead. And it's a group. So we are like, I don't know, I think we're there's 125 people on that group. But during like my time, it would be the majority of the people that I got to know through the groups. They would show up in the morning and explain fully vulnerable about what happened, what I'm faced with, and something that would be like, right now I need your support. I really need support. I'm going to this party. I don't know what to do. What am I going to say? And everyone would just like, yep, you've got this. You so got this, you know, and give some good advices. However, I think the beauty with it as well is that we will also talk about completely other things. Like one of the things that fascinated me is, how people are getting back on their bikes, doing their exercises, doing their yoga, doing their, like, so we're, I'm watching these videos from people just showing up. It's no like ready making, ready setting. It's just like, here we go, do a recording. And I do the same way. Okay. I've done dancing. I've done out of the bath and feeling like, oh, I'm not happy right now. <laughs> and like, everybody's like, thank you for sharing that's exactly what I needed in this moment and we're watching each other and I think what I love with it is that we can see each other so I don't really use Facebook pages really or the close group there the reason is just I feel so much more connected to the group and and I think it's the connection that that's what it is um you just want to support it and you want to receive the report. And, and I have to say that I think people on the outside would be, wow, blown away about the vulnerability and how easy it is to share. It makes me wonder what I was so scared of when we're just showing up, telling what we feel, and so many other people say, you know what? I got exactly the same thing. <sighs> Thank you. So the whole program has been perfect. Even, you know, I couldn't join your calls in the middle of the night, which would be 3 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just for further context for the, for the listener, think of Marco Polo as a Facebook group, but instead of communicating by the typed out word, you're communicating via video selfies. So it's kind of like a video selfie group. Um, except the selfies are not, look at me, aren't I so wonderful? Like the, you know, Instagram is in, in the wild, like influences in the wild where you have perfect lighting and beautifully framed and, and beautiful coiffed hair like mine. Of course, I have the, the world's great, greatest and most prepared hairstyle. Um, people just, you know, like we, we encourage people, first of all, to join our group, our Project 90 Marco Polo group. Um, there's 120 members in there at the moment or are filled with people who are either um, uh, going through our 90-day quit drinking program currently or people who have already completed their 90 days and are now alumni, like Rita, who's now 99 days. But there are people in there who completed their 90 days six months ago, um, a year ago, and they get to share about what life looks like at six months or a year, um, whether they are still alcohol-free or not. Now, most of them, I'm, I'm happy and proud to say, um, are st have still alcohol-free and have remained alcohol-free, but even those who have go gone back to drinking have done so um, only on occasion um, and it no longer controls them. It's no longer something that they need to consume because of social pressure or because of stress or because of anxiety. They now have ultimate power over that. So being in that group... And seeing such a diverse group of people all around the world at different stages of their alcohol-free journey or sharing powerfully and vulnerably is so effective um, because they've done so many studies of the human mind um, and they've done studies of, um, of people in groups. And what they've shown is that change occurs amongst like-minded people. So when you try to white-knuckle it and do it yourself, it's very challenging when you're in a group of people who are going through the same fears, the same challenges, the same um, euphoria, the same everything, then change becomes not just possible, it becomes probable. And I think that's what Rita is speaking to there, the power of community. 
Um, the other thing I would say as well, and what I try to develop and foster inside of, of, of this community that we've created here is that we make it aspirational, that we make it fun, that instead of us focusing on what we have to cut away and say no to or what we're depriving ourselves on, we're choosing the lifestyle that we want to lead. We're choosing what we say yes to rather than deciding what we say no to. And I hope that comes across certainly um, uh, because I, I, I don't, I find anything that gets us steeped in shame or embarrassment or feeling like we are stuck or that we have a problem or that we um, have to surrender to a higher power um, or surrender to what Rita was saying before is impossible. I just, first of all, I just don't like it. And second of all, I find it completely ineffective. So I hope that we've been able to foster a very positive aspirational group that results in transformation in many different ways. Um, certainly the evidence suggests that it has been producing that. Um, and I just want to say to you, Rita, as well, thank you so much for your contribution to that because not only did you allow yourself to be coached, but you also uh, were vulnerable and shared. And I know that you just being vulnerable and sharing inspired other people and kept them on their path and triggered them into taking powerful transformative action in their own life. So I just want to make sure that I acknowledge you for that and, and say an official <laughs> thank you here as well. Yeah. Thank you. I love right. it. I just have to say that I really, really love it. And, uh, and also just, you know, uh, one of the things you just shared by Marco Polo, I just want to go back to that. Uh, I've seen people jumping on who has been a part of the program for a year and uh, hearing how they have moved from using alcohol as a numbing technique to actually deal with their issue and where they are now at in their life and, and how they continue to evolve after 12 months as well is remarkable. So I think it's, it's not just kind of you saying no to something, you're saying yes to something which is so much bigger uh, to your own opportunity, to your own future, to actually opportunity to deal with the real issues, having the conversations that you probably avoided for a very, very long time. And that in itself solves so many issues. So yeah, I love being a part of the program. Yeah. Uh, Rita, just final question I wanted to ask you. Just tell me what your plans are for the future, um, not just around, you know, your relationship with alcohol, but I do want to ask you that. Um, mm -hmm. And you made a point that you, that you wanted to make a point um, just before we hit record on this to share this. Um, so I, I invite you just to share, you know, what your view is on alcohol and what the future um, is for you in terms of your relationship with alcohol, but also just what's in store for you anyway with this newfound creativity and, and clarity that you have? Yes. Thank you for asking. Um, so I have made this, this, the commitment to me that is the most important part is that I will never use alcohol as a, uh, as a remedy for creativity. So that means that there is a lot of areas that is absolutely a no-go. I will never turn to alcohol as a solution for something. If I will say yes to something when I'm attending something, yeah, maybe that will happen. I don't know because it's not in my, that is not the zone where I would use alcohol as something to pick me up. It's a different ball game. My, my area that has been uh, not leading me to where I want has been like I've shared this kind of, I'm now going to spend a week in creativity on my own. And then alcohol has been a part of that. No way. I'm not going there. I'm going absolutely no way. So, so my relationship with alcohol for the time being is alcohol free for, you know, I, I, I just don't see the point really, <laughs> to be honest, I don't see the point. And like, if I were to have a glass of something, then there must be something, I don't know what will make me go there, but, but it will definitely not be in seeking creativity. So that is a no go. Um, now, where it has taken me, and I think it was one of the reasons why I, I 
was appealed by joining your program was as an entrepreneur. We have an extreme responsibility for ourselves uh, as entrepreneurs to show up fully. And I want my life, my behavior to be a full expression of my business. My business is being in the moment. My business is about really slowing down in order to speed up. So I want to ensure that I'm walking my talk for the business. That's that's what I'm doing. And the the company that uh, I have been working on this concept called sustainability for three years. It's been this brewing word. I mean, because I work with women, I work with creativity and innovation, and I work around how do we create more sustainable solutions? And I've come to realize that in order to create sustainable solutions, there must be balance between the masculine and the feminine, which is why the she means she and he in order to create sustainability. So I finally moved my concept into workshops to uh, speeches how do we bring sustainability thinking into the corporate world how do we bring sustainability in the core of ourselves because it's all about where we are coming from it's not where we're going to it's about more thinking of the ecosystem than a community because it's everything we do has an effect on everything around us so what I've realized as a result of <clears throat> This time when my creativity is really on the deepest, deepest, deepest level, rooted in my own real true balance of uh, of the two powers of masculine and feminine is that this is what I want to help people with. So on the business side, I'm scaling. And so it's so funny because like I said, my the word for my year was exponential. How, you know, well, exponential turned out to a lot of exponential use in, uh, I don't know, uh, face masks and things that I never would have thought I would <laughs> include in exponential anything, exponential spend of money on these things, but exponential growth. And I didn't know that exponential would mean exponential growth in myself as a result of this. So this year is turning out to be what I intended it to be even though in time of adversity, of horror, of COVID, of the whole thing, it has made me be a much better resource of help since I started from from June until now. Um, So that's where I'm heading. I'm just continuing in my my purpose, which is to help others experience being fully liberated and fully expressed. That's, um, that's what I'm doing. Beautiful, Rita. Thank you so much for sharing that. And it's so wonderful to know that uh, you first kind of came into my ecosystem in 2017. In fact, yeah. um, you did a 30-day no alcohol challenge. In fact, you, you enrolled in that. I've got it right here in front of me because I pulled it up as we're, as we're talking. Mm-hmm. You enrolled uh, September 3rd, 2017, and then you applied to join our 90-day program the first time. Um, which was uh, July uh, 15th, 2019, you then uh, actually enrolled uh, in June, uh, I think it was June 25th or June, somewhere around there of 2020. And as we're recording this now, it's we're now going into October 2020. And then you've just shared where you're going in your life, which I think is a beautiful way to just wrap this up. So what an amazing journey and thank you so much for sharing and uh, w- with our listeners, of course, and with me. And I wish you all the best uh, in the future. And if you're listening here and you'd like to just check in with Rita and just see how she's doing and maybe ask after her son or ask anything about, um, you know, leadership and, uh, you know, anything at all what we discussed here, you can actually follow her on Instagram. Um, she's at Rita Houskin, R-I-T-A-H-A-U-S-K-E-N. Tell her that you heard her on the uh, the show here or wherever you're watching and digesting this and just see how she's going and say hello. Rita, hello. thanks for sharing some time with me. <laughs> you're so welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Alcohol Free Lifestyle Podcast. I want to load you up with some free stuff right now. So if you want to go to jameswanick.com slash guide, I will send you my Quit Alcohol Guide, which has helped six-figure entrepreneurs and top professionals 
reduce or quit drinking. You can also text the word quit guide to the number 44222 if you're in the US, of course. It doesn't really work anywhere outside of the US. But if you're in the US on your mobile phone and you'd like that guide, text the word quit guide to the number 44222 or you can go to jameswanick.com slash guide. If you'd like to schedule a free 15-minute call with one of my top coaches, just an exploratory call to see if or how we can help you, then you can go to jameswanick.com slash schedule, or you can text the word project90 to the number 44222 if you're listening in the US on a mobile phone. That's jameswanick.com slash schedule, or you can text the word project90, that's one word, project90, to the number 44222. Feel free to send me a direct message over on my Instagram account, which is at James Swanick. You can also watch video episodes of this podcast and a series of other educational videos on my YouTube channel, which is James Swanick One, or you can direct message me on Facebook at James Swanick Official. And finally, a request. Would you please now write a short review of the podcast inside of the Apple Podcast app on your phone or on iTunes on your desktop? Computer. Would you please give the show five stars and write a quick one or two sentence review? This will help the show get in front of even more listeners, potentially transforming someone's life. You can rate and review the show inside of your Apple podcast app on your phone or over on iTunes on your desktop. Thank you so much and I'll catch you next time.